Hello everyone. Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Max. So today we are going to understand one of the important limits in calculus, which is limit x goes to zero sine x over x, whose value is equals to one. And I'm sure most of you might have used this limit somewhere in calculations or might have heard about it or seen it somewhere. Nonetheless, this video is going to show you two ways of proving that why the value of this limit is equal to one. And interestingly, both of the two ways are graphical. So let's get started. Now, before we dive into the proofs of these limits, let's exactly first try to understand where do we use this? What is this application? So first we'll talk about a general overview and then we will talk about a specific example. Where do we use this limit? Now, in general, if you talk about the function y equals to sine x, it belongs to a category of transcendental function, which is a non-algebraic function. On the other hand, y equals to x is a linear function, which belongs to a class of polynomial functions. And polynomials are undoubtedly known to be the nicest and most convenient mathematical functions for analysis. So most of the times, as a mathematician, our goal is to get rid of the transcendental functions or try to get their approximation in terms of the polynomials. So that's exactly what this limit is going to do. It's going to tell me when does sine x behaves as x when x is going to zero. Now, if you talk about a specific example, so here we have a simple pendulum and if we have a look at the equation governing the simple pendulum, so we have this equation. Theta double dot plus omega square sine theta is equals to zero, where theta represents the angular displacement and theta double dot represents the angular acceleration. So now this being a nonlinear differential equation is hard to solve analytically, so but we want to solve it. So we will use an approximation, which is nothing but sine theta is approximately same as theta for very, very small value of theta. That means the ratio sine theta over theta is approximately equals to one when theta is small. So which is nothing but the same piece of information, which is coming from this limit, limit theta goes to zero sine theta over theta equals to one. After using this approximation, we get this equation, theta double dot plus omega square theta equals to zero, which is relatively easier to solve, being free from the transcendental function. We can find its analytical solution. In this video, I'm not going into finding the solution of this equation, but this was just to give you an idea where do we use this kind of limit. So now we know the application. Now let's talk about the proof. So technique number one, I'm going to have a look at the graph of fx equals to sine x. Now, most of us are aware about it. This is how the graph of y equals to sine x looks like. Now let's zoom in to closer to x equals to zero. Now why? I'm analyzing the graph closer to zero because remember, this is where we want to talk about. We want to see the behavior of the function sine x divided with x closer to x equals to zero because that's the interpretation of limit x goes to zero. So we have zoomed in closer to zero. And now if you add y equals to x along with y equals to sine x, so this curve is y equals to x. This curve is y equals to sine x. Now look at here, what's happening here. So when x is closer to zero, then we can see the graphs of y equals to x and y equals to sine x are almost indistinguishable. They are overlapping each other. That means sine x is almost same as x when x is very, very close to zero, or you can say very, very small in magnitude. And it's happening from both sides. Even if you see x is going to zero from the left, 
or if you see x is approaching to 0 from the right, the behavior is same. So in other words, if I have to give this into the definition of limit, then I will be writing this, that they are same. So that means their ratio is equal to 1 when limit x goes to 0, which is nothing but our required limit. So that's an easy way of proving. Just have a look at their individual graphs. You will understand why is this behavior. Now, in technique number two, I'm going to use right angle triangle inside a unit circle. So I've not shown you the whole unit circle here, but this arc is the arc of a unit circle in the first quadrant. And if I look at this, so this A, B, C, this is a right angled triangle. And if I just want to call this point, say D, then let's call this D. So now I've zoomed in over this right angle triangle here and only considering this portion. So this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. Now, if you define this angle as H, of course, this H is in radians because whenever we define angles at the center of a circle, we always use the radian measures for that. So if this is H, and since it's a unit circle, so this AC equals to one because this is nothing but the radius of the circle. So this automatically gives me this AB equals to sine H and BC equals to cosine H because if I use the definition of sine H and cosine H, so if this is H, so sine H is AB over AC, which is equivalent to AB over one. So that means AB is sine H. And if I use the definition of cosine H, so cosine H is BC over AC, which is BC over one. So that means BC is cosine H, right? So you get BC is cosine H and AB is sine H. Now, we want to come up with an explanation why AD is H. Now, if you use the formula for length of arc of a circle, the length of arc of a circle is radius times the central angle. Now, radius of this circle is one and central angle is H. So this is one times H is H. So the length of the arc, this AD is equals to H. So we establish that AD is equal to H and AB equals to sine H. So these are the two things we want to now focus on. So I'll be just building my attention to this AB, the, the line, this vertical line whose magnitude is sine H and AD whose length is H. Now we want to have a look at what happens when H goes to zero because that's what we are going to establish sine h over h when h goes to zero. So we have to do something geometrically which leads to h goes to zero. So in other words, I have to decrease the magnitude of this angle and see the corresponding effect on sine h and h. So let's do it. So this is originally h, this is ab, this is ad. Now let's reduce H. So I have shortened the angle. Now this is my new H. So with this new H, this is new sine H and this green curve is new H. So you see earlier the ratio of sine H by H was hugely different. Sine H in magnitude was looking considerably different from H. But once you have reduced the H, sine H is almost looking closer to h like if you compare their magnitudes let's do this further you further reduce h so now this purple line is the length of this is sine h and this purple arc the length of this is h so now they are gradually very very closer to each other so you see the effect that when h is becoming smaller or in other words when h goes to zero sine h is becoming approximately same as h. You can continue doing this further, further reduce the h, you will see 
this straight line and this arc will be almost unrecognizable. So they will be almost, the ratio will be almost equals to one. So that's the proof. We have established limit h goes to zero. Sin h over h is one. Although in the beginning I used the notation x, but that's one and the same thing, right? Even if you write it like this, it's one and the same thing. So hope you understood though both the proofs and I will hope you like the video and thank you for watching.